I, I think part of the reason why I love like running my own business so much is because I get to wear different hats. Like sure. I get to like switch. I could be, you know, um, I could be just marketing. I could be just sales. Totally. I could go to network. Like I love the variety. It's never boring. No. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Sometimes sure. I wish it was boring. Yeah. Right? Hi, everyone. I'm Christina Perla. I'm the host of Talking Design and Engineering. Join me today as we talk about the intersection between design, engineering, and creative technology. And with me here today is Dave Scheinkoff, co-founder of Smooth Technology. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. When did we meet? Was it last year? I think I reached out to Make Lab about a request to make something. Ah. I think it's what, and I was just called I think I must have called and I was just asking you about what you did what kind of your capabilities were and then we started talking and you were like you sounds like you know like a lot about 3d printing and I was like yeah I've been doing 3d printing since the cupcake maker box since the DIY build your own printer yeah so it was cool I don't get to talk a lot of people about who know that much about 3d printing so we ended up talking for a while on the phone and then I came to one of your like events here oh yes it was one of the yeah then you came by the smooth lab yeah. But that was probably a year ago, something like that. Yeah. Coming by the Smooth Lab was awesome. Thank you. Coming just from fabrication backgrounds, we're just like, this. I will never forget the organization. <laughs> that is not me. That is one of my partners, Sachem, who is incredible at organizing. I'm more chaotic good. And he's whatever You need that. a mix of both oh, yeah. he's, in these creative He fields. is whatever the other opposite of chaotic is and also good. Oh, yeah, I love that. So tell, uh, why don't we get started by you telling us a little bit about yourself and like how you got here. I'm sure, sure your journey to Smooth has been very long, interesting. And, sure. Yeah. Yeah, I learned, I did not really intend to go into technology. I was, I studied liberal arts. I studied literature and music when I was in college. And then... I just, while I was in college, I was teaching for my job. And then when I wanted to move to, that was in Boston, when I wanted to move to New York, the most reasonable experience I had for a job was teaching. So I got a job teaching high school here as an assistant teacher, history teacher. And I was, I came into a school that was just starting, like they had been a K through eight school and they decided to keep the eighth graders and start a high school. So I came in while the school was still not finished. They didn't even have a 12th grade yet. So they were hiring. It was like a total hiring blitz every year. So I got lucky and got hired there because they were hiring so many teachers. And they also didn't have, this is relevant, they didn't really have a lot of, other than the core classes for New York Regents curriculum, they didn't have any real other creative electives or anything like that. So I had an opportunity to start pitching classes to the principal, let's do this type of class. And, and, and so I was able to teach video production, which was tech leaning. So I like learned Final Cut and then audio production, which I'd studied music. So I was like a little bit more prepared to do that. You studied music? Yep. Oh, yeah, very yeah. cool. And, and then eventually I was started, it was a school that was specialized in, it was LD specialty school for learning disabled students. I pitched this class that was like a shop class, but a sort of safe shop class where we mm-hmm. didn't have like band saws and stuff yep. and so that class was electronics building things that had electronic components using like stuff from radio shack when radio shack existed <laughs> so that was in that was in like 2008 is yeah. when i started doing that and i did that for two years and then in 2010 the maker fair came to new york for the first time and so i went to that and i saw 3d printers for the first time and i saw the arduino for the first time and and I just walked around talking to all the college students there about what they were doing. And every single person was like, yeah, I used Arduino for this. And I was like, what the frick is that? Yeah. What is that thing? And I yeah. went to the gift shop there at Maker Faire and bought one. And that was like in the fall. And then I started learning how to use it. And then that January, when it became like second semester for the year, I just shifted my shop class to be like Arduino class. That so was like, we're going to learn prog- to teach programming and learn how to do stuff with Arduino, which compared to the previous version of electronics where you had to use do everything with analog circuitry, you could just do anything all of a sudden. So I started teaching that, and then I did that for about two years, and I was wanted to get out of teaching high school. I just I had done it for 10 years at that point. Uh, and so I started looking for jobs doing more creative, creative electronics, creative engineering. And I realized after teaching it for two years, I had to stay ahead of the students. And when you're teaching high school, you're teaching every day. Yeah. It's not like college where you have once a week. Yeah. Like it's every single day you have to have a lesson. And yeah. so like I had to progress in Arduino so fast to stay ahead of the students that I ended up learning a lot. 
I, I was coming with no programming experience or anything. So I had to learn it really incredible. fast. It was good. Yeah. Also, it was just at the beginning of Web 2.0. So it was before Adafruit's yeah. or just as Adafruit was starting. But Lemore yeah. Freed had her site before Adafruit, Lady Ada. And she had tutorials on there. And I just learned from the tutorials on her site, had That's a program. <laughs> and it just went from there. But those tutorials were really good. How many hours did you spend outside the classroom trying to just keep up and stay uh, ahead? A, a lot. <laughs> yeah. Just I pretty much. I would pretty much just school. When you're teaching, you my schedule was 8 to 4. The students would be out of there by 2.30. And then I had, so I had an hour and a half. Sometimes students would come after school, but sometimes they didn't. So I had mm -hmm. an hour and a half, like, on the clock. But then most days I would just stay until the security guards would kick me out at 8. I would just stay after school and oh, wow. learn for a couple hours. I, I, I don't know. I loved it. It was yeah. just like I was making robots just yeah. by myself in a little, the lab was like 8, my classroom was like 8 feet by 8 feet. It was so tiny. <laughs> yeah. It was like a broom closet. Yeah. But I would just, I loved it. Yeah, I would just stay after and learn. It's amazing. And then, and then when I left that, I started, I still was, I was still tutoring and stuff, which if you're teaching, that's like mostly how you make money in New York. And then I just started freelancing, doing electronics. And I realized like I was working totally in, in this insular way. Yeah. And when I started like seeing what other people were doing, I was like, oh, I'm like, I'm good at this. Like I had worked in this in isolation and learned so much that I was like, I'm like competitive in this in this with other people around because yeah. not that many people were doing it at the time. You're like, oh wait, I actually know more than, than this a lot of people. person and yeah. this person. Yeah, it's like, it was oh, a surprise. Wow. What is you obviously always have imposter syndrome in, always. in this world. Uh, always. Especially in New York. Yeah, yeah totally. There's so many people here. Yeah, and everyone's really good. Yeah. So, uh, so I started like getting some work, working for artists and then I met an artist who was starting this, um, Dustin Yellen, who was starting this nonprofit called Pioneer Works uh, and I told him if he wanted to start it, like I could come work there and start an education program at Pioneer Works if he wanted to do that. And he said yes. So I went there and started this education program for evenings and weekends for like adults. And I was teaching classes and I was finding teachers to teach interesting classes. And I had an opportunity there to continue teaching electronics, but to people who were older and more just older and could just just learn fast yeah. in high school you're still yeah. learning how to learn so like yeah. older people who work in their career and in, in a lot of them were in the advertising industry in new york mm. so they were interested in like the new emerging technology mm. for just advertising as it was like starting to become a the experiential what now is like the experiential world of advertising yeah. yeah so i was teaching to people who were knew how to program way better than me because they were doing javascript or, or mm. they were doing stuff like for their job or uh, flash and so that was really challenging to teach adults all of a sudden right. who were like programmers. And then I worked at Pioneer for about six years doing the education program. And then there was room to start like a technology program there. So I started that and started a tech residency. So I got to give residencies to people who were in the creative tech world. And then I essentially got to hang out with them and learn awesome. about what, they were, what was happening at NYU, at the ITP program at NYU, and the other sort of creative stuff, tech stuff around the city. Then while I was at, sorry, am I going on too long? No, okay. you're great, right. you're great. Uh, and then at Pioneer, I started also meeting artists that were working with more money and bigger budgets and other creative people. And I met a costume designer while I was working there who named Asher Levine, who's like a super futuristic costume designer. And we just met at an open house and he came in with this really crazy costume on and I was like, wow, it's a cool costume. And he was like, oh, I made it. It's kind of <laughs> like the Tiro Wax song. Yeah. And I was like, how'd you make it? And he described to me some of the process. And I was like, oh, this is, that's like really like involved and super technical. Yeah. And so we struck up a conversation. I was like, hey, if you ever want to do some electronics in the costume, just give me a call. Ah. And then he wrote me an email a couple weeks later and we started talking and we started prototyping things together. And then he got... And then he called me and was like, I got this gig doing a thing for Taylor Swift. Do you want to do it? And I was like, yeah, of course I want to do it. But oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah, oh, like, my gosh. And then I was like, holy shit, that's so much. Sorry. It's so much bigger you than anything curse. I've ever done. <laughs> yeah. So I had just recently met a couple other people who, once I was in this world doing the creative electronics, it's not a very big world. So yeah. 
people who know other people that do it are like, you should meet this person because they're doing this stuff else that I also don't, understand, don't yeah. understand. Like, I don't understand what yeah. you're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I met a couple of their technologists, and when I got this call about the Taylor Swift costume, this is in uh, 2015 for the Nine Tour. Oh. And I, so I called James and Dylan, these two other technologists who are now like the two, two fourths of smooth technology. Uh, and we all decided to do this costume together. We worked on it and it was very grueling. It was not a lot of money, but it worked and we did it and we went and saw it on the stage at the basketball stadiums and we were like, whoa, that freaking worked. Wow. And then after that job, which was like very, it was just such a level up for all of us that it just took us all doing runs of a couple days of no sleep, like really wow. grinding to finish this thing in time. Uh, and afterward we were like, hey, we all like work together on this thing in the really, in a really stressful way. We never got mad at each other. Like everyone, no one ever, yeah. no one, we all, no one ever felt like anyone was like not pulling their weight. That's the impressive part. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Aside and, from the work itself. Yeah. And so after Team. we were like, should we just do this more like together? Yeah. And the three of us had individually been getting like freelance gigs ah. that were not very much money, but we were like, Hey, if we collectivize, like we could make even less money on these gigs because we'd get a third of what we were getting. But if we do that in the short term, it will feel like less money, but it will probably turn into our capabilities are so much better as a team yeah and so we decided to do that and then we started getting gigs that were a little bit more money and then uh ultimately we, we then uh, that was three of us and then we uh, met another partner sachem um who was working with the flaming lips doing all of their touring lighting which was like incredibly uh cutting edge at, yeah. at the time uh and the four of us then all decided we we're like let's be this company together that's amazing. Uh, yeah, and then it took us at that after that point, it took us another year or so to like actually be able to quit our other jobs, right? T to do it because we had enough revenue, to, yeah, to to all take a huge pay cut, but still leave our other jobs and right. actually just do this, be able to live, yeah, be able to live <laughs> on it. So we did that. That was like in uh, the end of 2017. Wow, uh, we did, did that, and then we got and we got a studio together, and yeah, and then we made it. Like up to COVID, we were doing really great. And then during COVID, we had no income. Oh my gosh. Uh, and then we pieced together jobs and stuff like that through it, uh, made it through. And then now, like, that kind of world is it's back. back. And yeah, it's we're, fully back. Yeah, it's back. And <laughs> I so, feel it myself. <laughs> totally. Yeah, yeah. So it feels great. We're, we make, now we're making stuff again. And that's awesome. Uh, and yeah, it's been a, been a wild journey. I feel one of the best, I might have said this on another episode, but one of the best pieces of advice I ever got was just to keep doing what works. Just yeah, keep doing sure, it. Sure, sure. And I feel like your founding story of, of Smooth is just that. You found you worked well together. You made good product. You made good, really cool stuff. You got the clients. You had the network. Yeah. And you just kept doing it. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And collaboration. The fact that I saw a really great, I saw a really great, like, talk at a tech design tech conference by uh, this guy Kyle McDonald, who's a ITP professor and mm. grad. And it was about collaboration. Mm. And it was so inspiring. It was in 2014 I saw it. And I, he, he basically just talked through about his story and then how he decided to, it was, I think he was like, I'm just going to collaborate. I'm not going to work by myself anymore. And then he showed that once he made that decision to let go of having to have total ownership of what you do, like letting go of having to be the star and like the person, the genius behind everything, how much that opened up his possibilities to build things that were so much bigger than he could ever do on his own. And I saw that talk and he showed the stuff that he did. I was like, oh, and they were just like brilliant, pro one after another, wow. these just brilliant projects. And I was like, I want to do that. Is that the moment that told you this is what you wanted to do? I, I just, that was a moment where I was like, I'm going to just not be though. I don't care about being the owner or being like the main person in charge anymore. I just want to like work with other people. And that was when that, that, and that was a big part of like when we started working what, with what was going to become smooth of me pushing for, let's just pull our stuff, pull our research together. Yeah. Let's work together and let's just use all of our abilities together. And that was a major, that was like a major contributor to what became smooth. Cause we all know of needing to be in charge. Yeah. And that it was great. And I never want to go back. I love yeah. collaborating. It's also, I don't know. It's also really scary to do stuff by yourself. It is. You know? It is. I heard somewhere along the lines that at one point we were talking to a lot of different VCs and they said how they preferred to invest in in companies with at least two founders because it's just so difficult on your own. It's yeah. a really difficult world to navigate, like growing a business and yeah. like starting your own business by yeah. yourself with no yeah. support. Totally. 
It's, I yeah. couldn't imagine doing this by myself. Me neither. Yeah. yeah. So it's great. <laughs> I, I think part of the reason why I love like running my own business so much is because I get to wear different hats. Like sure. I get to like switch. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, I like it. It, it, it. It's good. It's fun. Uh, especially in the creative world where yeah. you get to like really do, you just change scope so much where you're like working on the minutia, but then you're also getting to talk to clients about like really vague ideas and help them solidify them. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's fun too. Yeah. Yeah. It's a fun world. So would you say the moment that you felt like this was the direction you're heading in and this is where you want to go, was that when you were the, the teacher doing oh. the Arduino class? Or was it the Maker Fair moment? I, I think th- when I... Yeah, when I first saw the Arduino and I saw that it, what it could do at Maker Fair, and then I started learning the the basics basics of C plus. Yeah. I just yeah I was like man you could fuck, you could make anything with this thing yeah and that was a huge thing for me because it just it tied in so many things that I like yeah I like physical building stuff but I also love like logical problem solving yeah and it was really those yeah. two things like put together and just yeah that it was that, I'm glad. That I that was when I was 32 was yeah. like the first time I ever thought that I would ever write code, and so I'm glad in a way that I like lived a whole life before that. But I also wonder what it would have been like if that had existed when I was in college. Yeah. It did sorta, but not for me. I right. never. My I had a computer class in high school, and mm-hmm. it was typing. We learned <laughs> typing, so that's that was yeah. really like wow. Uh, I yeah, it existed. In fact, the class before my typing class was a computer programming class in my school in my high school and these were like old monochrome computers and the students in the programming class used to always just write viruses <laughs> and so sometimes we'd come into typing class and it would just the screen would just have a smiley face on it and this teacher was this old lady miss harborough she's like too. she was like i don't know what we should do i don't know what we do <laughs> that's when we would have study hall i should have known that that's actually cool yeah, and yeah. i remember kids were like writing programs writing tetris yeah. on our ti-85s and stuff oh wow yeah well, there were some there was programming existed obviously but just there was no entry point for me at all yeah I, was, yeah there wasn't it wasn't really taught it, it wasn't taught in public school at least in maryland that, yeah so. i was pretty limited myself we did have computers we did have some programs i got to learn autocad the 2d version cool. i learned illustrator i think in in high school which was pretty cool yeah. as well but nowadays kids are learning like how to operate 3d printers sure. like in fourth grade There's a lot of stuff like roblox and Minecraft. Yes. There's just so much stuff yes. that is... Gamified. Yeah, gam- gamified programming. Yeah. Um, which is sweet. And then I've taught Scratch a bunch. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Scratch is unbelievable. There's That's a lot incredible. of stuff, that computer literacy and stuff, so... It's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing what we've seen in a lifetime, huh? Yeah, for sure. No, and, uh, <laughs> it definitely... It's, it, it also puts a fire under your ass because you're like, man, I'm, I'm 45. Like, yeah. I, I can't learn as fast as kids who are 18 or yeah. 14 now and like they're just gonna blast past me and all this stuff so I have to figure out how to stay relevant and, yeah. and useful that's always the struggle in this yeah, world right yeah. of design and engineering and making things totally staying relevant yep but I don't know the key is I guess just I don't know like you said just find figuring out what is exciting to you and yeah I think like finding the Venn diagram of what you like to do and what you're good at and like just finding the tiny that's the key like the tiny overlap between those and just yes. carving your place in the world in it's there all about somehow strengths and weaknesses yeah yeah I'm good at like doing yeah that's that's the combo you want i know it's not <laughs> that's always the dream easy. Yeah. there's always the good at and don't like doing but you don't want to be sure. doing the bad or like, and like doing, doing and are terrible at yeah <laughs> <laughs> you don't want that that's yeah. not good for anybody i learned that recently that a framework so your first project was the taylor swift yeah, it was dre- a dress for this, for the, yeah, 1989 tour. And it was like a dress for Taylor and then a bunch of dancers. And they were all radio control costumes. That's and awesome. we had to build the radio system and wow. we had to build the LED and the LED and the programming and all that. And we learned a lot about what happens when you put LEDs on a dancer. We just went to the first rehearsals and the dancers were like doing somersaults in the costumes. And we were like, oh my God, this is just never going to work. We're going to break every night. <laughs> I was going to ask, because yeah. that's like definitely something that you have to design around. Yeah, for know? sure. No, it was definitely, we learned a lot in a very short so period of time. how did you... How, what, so that moment of just watching the rehearsal, oh, you're like, oh, yeah. shit, this is not going to work. Like, how did you, then what? We just, we figured out what's the most important part. It's the costume that she's wearing. 
And so we just made sure that one always worked. Yeah. And I don't know, there's eight dancers or ten dancers, so if something goes wrong on one of them, it's not that big of a deal. So we just, just went with what was the most important and figured out a way of keeping things working for the duration of the tour. Yeah. Uh, and how many how many shows on that tour? So many. I don't know. A lot. <laughs> <laughs> Hundreds, probably. It was yeah. so many. Yeah. Uh, but it was That's good, so and it worked. Cool. And I don't know. We Through that, we learned a lot, and we've done a bunch of tours since then using our radio system. And other like other types of LED arrays and other types of yeah stuff That's like so that. Cool. So yeah, so it's been it was good and we it's a cool it's a cool industry to work in because the people working in it are at such a high level. Yes. And so you are always seeing like the top of everybody and it's very challenging to it's inspiring and challenging to see what people are doing with like on that scale. So, yeah. yeah. That's so cool. So many things to, to consider as well. You, sh- you probably had to make a lot more than just what was being worn. Like you, you had to back up. Stairs. And, yeah, for sure. Like yep. everything. Yeah, we learned about that. And then when you're handing something off to a team, like in case this case, like the, the costume team for the tour, they have to know how to charge it. Ah, they have to know how to, to train them. service it, how to troubleshoot and all that stuff. So that really was wow. good for us in learning how to like document. And uh, that's such a key key part of it when you're, wow. when you're handing something off. Wow. Yeah. That's so interesting. And that yeah. was your first project. Talk yeah, it was about our, scale. that was our first gig. It was, yeah, it was wild. <laughs> Coming then, out with a bang, huh? Yep. So it, it was, it really, it proved to us that we could do something on yeah. that level. And it proved, I think, also a lot to potential future clients that we right. knew what we were doing. And right. In that, in that world, like in the entertainment world, when you're first starting out, it's very normal for people to do stuff for almost no money yeah. because of it for the exposure and credibility yeah. and stuff. And so we definitely did in that world a lot of work for very little money. And it's, we still do sometimes. Yeah. Uh, and it's worth it in a lot of cases. There's a lot of things where we've done stuff for the Met Gala, like mm. these like high level costume things, high visibility. And a lot of the designers that work for those don't really make money on it, yeah. but it's incredible exposure and it's not always a good idea to work just for exposure, but sometimes it is. Yeah. And if you think about what it gives you in terms of visibility, and you think about what you could have maybe charged on that, and if you had taken that money that you would have charged on that, and turned that $10,000 or $20,000, and turn, put that into uh, promotion or press, right? Spending that money, you probably wouldn't have got that level of exposure. Exactly. So it is sometimes worth it. It's, totally. But you can also totally. get, and I've seen and felt this, you can be taken advantage of in, in sure. that world. You just have to be realistic about how to what, what it is. Yeah. yeah, and be clear with the people you work with about that they need to represent you in posts and things like that yeah. to make sure that you do get the exposure that that gives you access to. I feel like this is like not an uncommon problem in the world of talented creatives. Sure. Like you, you hear and you, there's so many conversations about this all the time. It's sure. just, yeah. it's a skill that we have to learn that you don't learn in school. <laughs> You yeah, have totally. to learn on the go. Totally. Yep. Yeah, yeah. It's it's yeah. It's in the world of music and TV and film. So many people want to work in that world. Yeah. Uh, that it's very normalized in fashion. Very yeah. normalized to yes. work for no money. Yeah. And Unfortunately. Be, yeah, but it is the reality is that everyone wants to work in that world. It's really sexy. Like yeah. people want to work on TV. It's very glamorous. Yeah, it's glamorous. So that's just the reality of it. And you have to be realistic about it. Like you mm-hmm. don't want to get taken advantage of, but you do have to play the game sometimes. Yeah. And so Completely. it's a matter of just making sure that if you are doing it for exposure, that you actually get the exposure mm-hmm. and you get credit. Like follow through. Yeah. 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 And a lot of times and we work with that a lot where we've done it enough that we know now when we work on a job, that's not uh, a lot of money, but it's meant it's a lot of visibility that we make it clear at the beginning that we need the credit and we need the things that will actually make it worth it to us. Otherwise we won't do the job. Totally. We're in a position now where we can do that and we can say no to stuff. We were not in that position a couple years ago. Right. We had to do stuff regardless. Yeah. And we got, it worked out for us, but we definitely did a lot of work for little money. Yeah. uh, A lot of times. Yeah. It's part of the reality of those industries if you Mm -hmm. want to work in them. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Totally. So what would you say, You've done a lot from 2017 to now. What would you say is like the coolest project, the standout one that you will always remember I don't know and that. talk about? Yes. They're all so weird and cool. <laughs> We've just done a couple cool, like weird products. Look, in addition to the entertainment industry, a lot of our work is in the advertising world. Mm-hmm. So we get approached by advertising agencies to build like a gadget for a promotional campaign. So we did something for 
this year we did something for Doritos called Silent Doritos. <laughs> it was like a full. It was a fully software project. It had no physical component. Yeah. Uh, but it was a it was a piece of software that you could use when you were on Discord uh, playing games with your friends that would use AI to silence the crunches of the Doritos while you were gaming, but not affect your voice. So we use like AI sound, like digital sound. Because you're on a mic when you're gaming. With the headset, yeah. yeah, yeah. So we're using digital signal processing and AI, DSP, to mute the crunches, but not the voice. And we like trained, we trained them all on a bunch of crunches. That's so cool. Yeah, it, was cool it was a cool project. That's uh, freaking and, awesome. And so that was a fun one. That was this, for us, like it's whatever we did recently. We're always like, oh, that was so cool. And yeah, yeah. We've done some cool, we did some stuff for, for Meta a few years ago that was for the Quest headset. Yes, we made we like all one. these gadgets that were like, a, we they were not a product that was going to be released, but they were like treated as if they were yeah. for Christmas a couple years ago, where it was like a thing that you put on your water bottle that would tell if you were doing sports in your headset it would alert and send you a message through messenger into the headset that you like hadn't drank water enough because <laughs> it like had a accelerometer and stuff on the water bottle so it knew when you were drinking oh. and it had a pet oh if you hadn't fed your pet it alerted you and you could push a button on the headset and it would <laughs> too like too much time in send, vr yeah it would send <laughs> forgot a, about reality eject a treat for your pet it was all this kind of jokey stuff of you getting too absorbed in vr that you forget to do and do stuff things, like that yeah. I don't know. So I'm, I'm reading this book infinite jest right now by david foster that, wallace that's a big one <laughs> it's huge yeah it's huge but it's really good and the main premise is this movie comes out that's so good that it's fatal and people when they see it they just want to watch it over and over until they die of dehydration that's the movie. Sorry, that's the plot of the book. It's an incredible <laughs> book about our world. And it was written in the 90s, and it's so nails, like, On, the stuff like, that's in our world. But the, the Oculus, I'm sorry, the Quest project was like that. It was like, you're going to de- get dehydrated and die uh, if you keep playing Quest. You have to come back to the real world to drink water. <laughs> it's like a sort of dark yeah. joke a little. So that was a fun project. Is this that's week. fun. Yeah. That's fun. Uh, and then we work, the, I don't know if you know the artist, Lori Anderson. Uh, we've been working. She's an artist who... Uh, it's been around since the 80s, mm-hmm. and so she's like, uh, she's in her 70s now, and so she had a big retrospective at the Smithsonian, and so we've built a bunch of robotic projects for her that are uh, always like wild and wacky and cool. Yeah. And so those have been fun over the past couple of years. Wow. We built like a robotic goat, like an eight inch long robotic goat, uh, using a lot of 3D printing, actually. We did a lot of uh, SLA printed parts for Yeah. Them. That's uh, so cool. Yeah, it was cool. And they had like really all this armature and like mechanical moving parts using oh, uh, wow. Bowden tubes like wow. uh, to control it. And it ran in a museum. It was it ran in a museum for eight months every day and work didn't break, which is yeah. pretty crazy for a robot. Yeah, that's insane. So. That's so cool. And I remember we can edit this out if, it, if we can't talk about it. But I remember when we visited your shop, you were talking about this museum in Philly. Oh, yeah. That's, that yeah, we can talk about it. That looks so cool. Yeah, it opened. It's called Otherworld. Uh, that it's... looks so cool. Because what was the other... Uh, Meow Wolf. It was like a more highly advanced... Yeah, totally. It was like a... Well, the Meow Wolf was like the original of this type of museum. Yeah. Uh, actually, City Museum in St. Louis is maybe the original one of this. Okay. It's really cool. But Meow Wolf started probably in 2015, 16, yeah. maybe. Yeah. It's just an artist collective that made this crazy experiential museum and then they got funding from maybe the game of game of thrones guy they got funding from some creative yeah. di- director and then they became an institution they opened one in uh, las vegas which i just went to last the end of last year i think they've opened a couple others and so other people have tried to replicate that model we've worked for a few of them but this one called other world that started in ohio and then they opened in philly did a really good job they had their own sort of they differentiated themselves from Meow Wolf in like their it's very colorful LED driven so yeah. there's a lot of like really wild visual so cool. LED stuff so we did a lot of the LED programming and design oh, and they that's are so cool yeah it's great it's in Philly it's in Northeast Philly and is it how long is it up for it's permanent I'm pretty sure they have a 10 year lease amazing so, yeah and so it's open oh, I definitely want to go it's check a cool it place out. it's not far from New York yeah yeah it's uh, a simple train ride or a drive yeah. yeah so we worked on that for about a year that's awesome. And th- yeah, we've worked now on a few uh, museums like that. Yeah. And they're popular. I, I think that, I'm not sure. You're always wondering what will what the future of experiential stuff is. And there's certainly a lot of those that range from like selfie museums 
to <laughs> to honestly their the closest precedent before these was like a children's museum right where it's like this is a children's museum but it's also for adults maybe like liberty science center liberty science is a great example yeah, yeah. science museums yeah but other world and i think meow does this too they have a daytime program where you it's like a museum where families yeah. come in and then they close and then they reopen at night and i think it's 18 plus or 21 plus that's amazing and they have a bar and it's oh. more of a scene yeah you know for like older people yeah thing so they try to make something that appeals to kids but also adults that's very uh, cool and it's a yeah it works it, it's a cool it's a cool setup i don't know it's a cool yeah it's a cool idea yeah that's awesome i can't wait to visit it yeah it's great yeah uh, and I, also meow wolf is awesome if yeah. you're in santa fe or Vegas or I think there's another one Denver. in Denver. Yeah, yes, yeah. I went to the one in Denver. Oh, you did? Cool. Um, as part of this work trip. It was like one of the fun activities that we cool. did. What, what, did you like it? I thought it was pretty cool, yeah. but I personally I wanted to see a little bit more electronics and like futuristic. It did feel, there. Were, it, we also went during the day, so it was flooded with kids. Yeah. And yeah. so I feel like if we had more of the adult experience, maybe it would have been more more like in line with totally. us and our yeah. vibe. But Mel Wolf has more of a a textile -y hand like yes it's very organic it. yeah it feels very like there were a lot of woven yeah, things totally yeah it was really interesting but but yeah so what is what's your process like there's so many bits and pieces in all of this you have to figure out the electronics you have to figure out usability you have to train staff sometimes what is what is your design and engineering process per project like how do you how do you start? Good question. <laughs> it varies so much from project to project. So sometimes we'll get a client who comes in and says, we want to make this product. Here's the, and now it's, here's a picture of it generated by AI. Yeah. We get a lot of that, which is <laughs> it's fine. It's honestly, uh, until you are looking at a picture of the thing you're going to build as a rendering, as if it's already built, like no one knows what you're all talking about. And so we use Rhino, the three modeling yep. software to do a lot of like building and rendering mm -hmm. before we build anything so we can show the client like this is what we're making right That's awesome and they're like yeah that or no not quite that mm -hmm. until you have that visual representation it's really hard for a group of people to understand what you're all making together right because people have very different set. ideas yeah. yeah you don't want people to be disappointed or misled into what you're making yeah so we do that a lot of that well, the a client will of... sometimes have a very clear idea about their, right. what they want sometimes the client will come in and say we want something just really cool so you let the client really decide like usability and stuff and you're there to just to like not just but bring it to reality so your sure. ideation process is about matching what's in that person's mind sure yeah or like hearing their what they want and seeing their budget <laughs> yeah. and saying what you want is not quite in your budget but here's a version that is yeah and then selling that to them and they and letting if them decide it, yeah that. let them decide and if they're happy with it then we go through and right we just uh, in smooth our process a lot of it is like hanging out on the google meet together yeah and just spitballing and ideating yeah. and and suggesting things and trying to pre-troubleshoot what would be hard or easy about each of those things and then the four of us the four four engineers co-founders all have really different approaches and really different specialties. Yeah. We'll defer to the person that knows the most about mechanics or software architecture in that category mm. and let them drive and let everyone ask questions and suggest stuff, but we'll defer to the person that is the most experienced in each thing to help be the guide for that. And then we'll start actually just making it as fast as possible, the first version of it. That's the thing that's so important is all, that's, you came to our studio and you saw yeah. that like in our studio, we have this wall that is like every imaginable piece of electronics yeah. in existence. Yeah. Labeled one, and color coded. Yeah. Like yes. one of everything. So that if someone needs something that involves like a liquid pump, we have a liquid pump. It may not be the perfect one, but we have something that like the day someone asks us about something before we try to come up with a price or anything like that, we just try to make it in an hour or two just so we can just be like, okay, it's possible. We're not pitching <laughs> something that's going to completely screw us. Proof of concept for yeah. yourself. Yes. Yeah. So we, we really do a lot of that, like incredibly fast proof of concept. And that's something that, that I learned, started learning early in the process. I think when I was teaching is that I have to teach this thing tomorrow. Like, <laughs> let me just see if I can make a cardboard and duct tape version of this right now before I even go further totally. in the process. And that is such an important part of it. I, I think it's a part that not everyone realizes the importance of. I think it's easy to get stuck 
not making something because you're like, I'll just wait till it's like the perfect time and I have all the money to do it. And then at that point, I'll figure it out. And you can really go down the wrong road really far totally. if you don't figure the problems out really quickly yeah. that, that will come up. We treat things very similarly. Whenever we get like a large volume order, yeah. we always like to test out orientation first totally. for one, even if it means delaying the start of the bulk production yeah. and it means maybe we're a little bit tighter on those deadlines. Like we'd be even tighter if we produce a hundred quantity of something to throw them out. Yeah. and then didn't test. Totally. Like yep. it, it's such, it's almost in high school. They're like, always check your work for, ch check your test for spelling yeah. before, check your work before handing it in. Yep. It's very similar. Totally. <laughs> very yeah. similar concepts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's it. And we, I don't know, we all love that part of the process yeah. too, because it brings us back to like how we started, yeah. which is just the messing around and doing things just yeah. for fun. We all love this sort of prototyping process. The research uh, and, yeah. and experimental phase. Yeah. So we yeah. do that and now we have we're learning, we're trying to learn how to grow as a company. Mm -hmm. And that part, we're, part of that involves, that part we, which we really love, letting go of it a little bit because we have employees and yes. in interns. And part of it is like saying to an employee, try this, here's the basic description of it and like just Google it and figure out what exists and what can we make today, what version of it to like chip away at the unknowns. Yeah. And that's, that's a huge part of our process. Yeah. Usually by the time we're making the thing, we've made every part of it already. Wow. And so it's just a matter of figuring it, it all together. you've already hammered out all the kinks. Yep. All the different components. Yeah, generally. So then you've really lessened your troubleshooting and risks. Yep. Totally. Yeah. That's very smart. That's very well, it's smart. Just, it's because it's so scary <laughs> to be <laughs> making, we're always inventing something. Yeah. You know, we're always making something that someone comes to us because it hasn't, you can't buy it. Yeah. It hasn't been made before. And so like for us, it's an, it's a scary venture because by the time you say yes and get the deposit on it, like you've committed to making something that doesn't exist and yeah. like you have to make it yeah. somehow. Yeah. And so for us like to go into that, knowing that it's possible is pretty important or yeah. that we have a backup. Totally. Know. Totally. Wow. That's so interesting. So how many people are on a team per project? Would you say? Or what roles even? Do you have a dedicated, uh, yeah? Not really. We have the four of us that started the company. Yeah. We're our four engineers. We have three part-time employees. We expand a little bit and we bring in other people. Once, if we have a project where we have to make a lot of units of something, we can bring in more people. It's when we try to do it as concentrated as possible. So when you have someone who has the time, you can train them and they can stick around until the project is done. And that's it. That's it. We have we bring specialists in sometimes. Like for example, for the Doritos project, we had a friend who specialized in a audio, so we brought them in. And another friend who specialized in software deployment, mm. so we brought in two specialists because we needed to release a software. Mm. And so we do that, but it's we don't do it that often. Yeah. And a lot of times we we yeah we work as a pretty small team. Wow. We'd love to expand, but we're at a place where it's. That is a challenge yeah. because before our four co-founder engineers work so closely and so well together that it, in bringing in another lead mm. is intimidating, expensive. Yes. So it's we're that's where we are now. Yeah. We're trying to figure out how do we pull up size wise, and yeah. it's it's a challenge. We'll do it. Yeah. But we're now in the process of figuring out how to do that in a smart way. It's a good problem to have, though. You yeah. know, it's definitely. A, a, Someone coined the term to me, luxury problem. <laughs> uh -huh, sure. Because <laughs> yeah. you're there, you just need to put, put two and two together and, yep. and figure it out. Yeah. yeah. How much, now that you're six, six years into the business, six, seven? Yeah, about six. Six. Yeah. How much learning do you do per project for new capabilities when you don't bring someone in? A lot. Every project is, yeah, every project is something that hasn't been done before, really. Yeah. And it's, I'm not saying we're inventing every technology, every project we do has components that have been done before, but yeah. we're asked, being asked to be able to invent a product. Yeah. Like essentially make a run of 10 of a product yeah. in four months. Yeah. And so we're constantly having to figure out what's possible and what's been done before, how to put something together. And so we're always learning new parts of the process. Before sort of filming today, you and I were talking about finishing. Yeah. Like having a product that when it's done, looks like a product that came off of an assembly line right. with injection molding and all that, and doing a run of 10 yeah. of that which is not necessarily possible to make an injection molded die for. Yeah. We're constantly learning. A lot of what we're learning right now is like just the arts and crafts part of it. Like yeah. Like painting and, and things that make yeah. something look legitimate and real yeah. uh, to, to a client or a customer uh, at the end of the day, even though you just made it in your shop. Yeah. You know? it's, it's cool. It's fun. But it's, yeah. 
It is so hard. It's so <laughs> that part is really difficult. We make lab, at Make Lab. We did that in the first two years of the business. We used to make things look not 3D printed. Yeah. And so we've done 28 inch diameter molecules for a show that needed to be shipped all the way from here to California. Yeah, yeah. And we, if you look at our buy list off of Amazon, it's like ping pong balls. Totally. <laughs> yeah. You just do what you can, then you yeah. have to figure out how you're going to paint it. You're going to have totally. to make it, how do you smooth out all the lines? Yeah. We've done things with full color sandstone, uh, which was a really cool material. Very fragile though. Sure. Yeah. I've seen the Keanu Reeves sculpture. There was, with, when that process first came out, someone made a scan of Keanu Reeves and printed it in yeah. full color. And it was like, every time you looked up that process, you saw this little oh, that's funny. image of Keanu Reeves sitting that's funny. the print of it. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. It looks really cool. It's but a it really, yeah. yeah, it looks, it's a really cool technology. Uh, it's like kind of phasing out a little bit cause it's, I don't think they've innovated on that tech sure. on, on color jet printing right, fully, right, right, right. at least in sandstone it's like not capacity. Not quite good enough looking to be the final product. Yes. And so what's it for? Yeah. I don't know if it's ever really hit product market fit. So I don't know if if a lot of dollars have been invested in it. But what you what we did do with it was we made these like 12 inch in diameter orbs for like Verizon. And so we had a Huff one that that was like all made of like key keyboard keys for HuffPost. We made one that was like all screens. We made one that was all these like blocks for AOL, colorful blocks. And those were all full printed in one piece? Two pieces or, uh, because uh, two halves. Okay, gotcha. The machine couldn't fit a full sure, sure. full one. Plus, it's optimized more if you do each. Flat side. Yeah. Um, yeah, but we did a ton of sanding, a ton of clear yeah. coating. <laughs> yeah, right. Buffing out in between. Um, it was tough. That was a tough time in the business. Yeah, that, sure. It yeah. felt like school all over again. Finishing is is one of those things that's just really tough. That's yeah, really hard. Yeah. yeah, it's a way different skill set. Uh, totally. And people who are good at it are so good. They're so. <laughs> they're just. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. It, it's like second nature. Yeah. Half of it is setup, I've learned. Definitely. Yep. It's just mostly setup. Yeah, it definitely is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a lot of painting this year, and we've moved from spray painting on the roof <laughs> to being like, oh man, there's, there's, you have to pay attention to wind and dust yes. and all that stuff. Yeah, especially getting, in the city. Yeah, like getting a booth and like getting a booth on the roof and then being like, shoot, we can't do this on the roof anymore, and then <laughs> building a booth with vented booth in our space. We don't make anything big, so it's like a tabletop booth we set up. Yes. So we we learned a lot this year about that. Like, it's a I don't know. It's a fun process. Yeah. But uh, but you definitely it's a steep learning curve. Yes, very, very steep. Now knowing where your career was heading, what's one thing you wish you learned earlier in your career? I was thinking about this question. Shoot, I feel like I had a really good answer, but <laughs> I think the 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 idea about like making things really quick like the quick and dirty version of stuff I don't know in a way I wish like I said before that that I was able to learn programming earlier in my life but I'm not sure I think that like developing a process and like the logic of stuff before learning that was I think Mm -hmm. really helpful for me Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and developing like my brain outside of programming like Mm -hmm. in the physical world was really good yeah for sure yeah yeah, it's, it's a tough question because you don't regret anything. Your journey's your journey. Right, yeah. But, yeah, I think about that, too, in times of reflection. Like, what what's one thing I wish that I had taken more advantage of during school, maybe, to yeah. help me in my later years? But Yeah, I wish I had taken calculus. It's really? It's hard to learn now, yeah. Do you use calculus? No, because I don't know it. <laughs> but could you use calculus? Probably. In your work? I use I like use trig a lot. Really? Like, yeah, you use trig a lot if you're drawing programmatically and things like that, or calculating any mechanical oh. motion. Trig's really helpful. I was always wondering the real life, like everyday use cases of like trig and calc. I'll tell you the most the fun one. Actually, when you talk about uh, our most best product project we ever did, yeah. I forgot. There's one that we did that was actually the best, and it was while I was working at PioneerWorks. This is the origins during early smooth technology days when I was still working at PioneerWorks. We built this robot called the Fundroid that we did for, uh, I used to run a software conference there called uh, Software for Artists Day, mm-hmm. which is, still happens. It's really good. That's awesome. We built this robot that we, tr- we uh, you could send it out. Engadget wrote about it so you can read about it. It oh, was wow. called, the, yeah, the Fundroid. And it was built on a, on a mobility scooter chassis. And it had like arms with these hands with spikes that could hold a pizza. So we sent it out self-guided to go to the pizza shop it could speak and order a pizza and drop money and then the pizza would like the guy at the pizza shop would like 
it had one button. It was like a one button interface where it would talk to you and, and tell you to push the button when you put the pizza in its hands and it spiked the pizza box with its sharp thumbs and then it drove back. It drove back and delivered the pizza. It took it went a block and a half to the pizza place and it took the whole journey took three hours. And it was in the winter, so the pizza got back and it was frozen. <laughs> but it was such a cool project. And and then we sent it back out to get beer to the same store to yeah. get beer. The way that thing navigated was partly through GPS, but GPS in a city with buildings is inaccurate because the, um, yeah. the signals bounce off the yeah. buildings, and so you get these inaccuracies. So we used this thing called odometry, which is the two wheels. It's like a skid steer type uh, locomotion where it has two motors and two wheels, and the rest of the body just drags. So it pivots around a center point yeah. right with the two wheels. And so uh. I looked up this, the process of this thing called odometry, where each wheel, when it turns moves along a circular path around the other wheel as the center. So if you just think of it in terms of it just has one wheel, you can use the circumference of that wheel, yeah. its rotation, and it pivots around that circle. Okay. And both wheels actually do that. Okay. And those two motions put together actually turn into the motion of the uh, robot. So you can do formulas for that, and it's all trig. And so I was doing, oh. I was like, oh, this is going to freaking work. And I just started like doing all of it. And I made a version of it, like the quick and dirty version of it, where I was using like processing to just visualize it. Basically, the robot was moving in the room, in the lab, and processing was using just odometry to plot it on a grid. And so you're looking on the screen at this robot moving and looking at the room and you're like, it's working. Like it's actually working, the odometry stuff. That was a use of trigger. I was like, yeah, this stuff, yeah, it works. Whoa. They like, okay. really had it going on in Persia in the 900s. Wow. They were, they were like, they were good. Wow. My, my mind's blown right now. <laughs> it's, that stuff works. It's yeah. so awesome. Yeah, yeah. That's very cool. That's very cool. Okay. So calculus, you wish. I, I wish I learned that just because it seems so cool. Just, I don't know. It's really good. At, as far as I understand it, it's really good at just estimating stuff. Huh. Like predicting and estimating stuff. I don't know. I don't know it. I won't yeah. learn it, but I'll figure, I don't know. Eventually we'll have a project where I have to learn it. But also one of my partners is really good at it. Oh, there you go. It. <laughs> Strengths and weaknesses. Yeah. yeah. Good at like doing. Yeah. <laughs> so what's, so what's next for Smooth this year? I or th- and beyond? Yeah. I, it, I think we're just getting better. We're always trying to get better at what we do and just make things that look nicer is always for us mm. like a really big thing because our we've been a very like function forward company and yeah. we've always hired people to build the exterior of it and we're never going to build large we build large stuff sometimes but we don't have the facilities to make something large yeah so we work with partners that can do that yeah uh, but on small stuff we're just getting better at better at making things that look like just finished and that's like a such a nice thing uh, we've always focused on the kind of like brains of the thing mm-hmm. we're building but I think we're getting better and better at, at like mechanical moving oh, things and, cool. the, and the structure on the outside like the skin of stuff and that's always like I don't know it's nice it's just yeah. nice to make something and look at it and be like man that thing that looks like when you buy a product you can't imagine that it like was made by a person yeah but it was yeah I, I when I was in college I had this job at um, a car garage and the mechanics that I worked for were really good and one of the mechanics gave me an incredible piece of advice, which was, when you're looking at something, just know that the thing you're looking at, no matter how complex it is, was just made by a person. Yeah. There's no super person that made it. It was literally it's, just it's a magic. regular person. Yeah. And a person made it, so you are a person, you can understand it. It's just a matter, that person may have spent a lot of time learning that process, but you got time too, and you can learn that. And just That's understanding that, good. like, it's just like democratizing a little bit. Yes. And yes. I don't know, this is an incredible piece of advice. Eddie Crisatelli told me that, who's one of my mentors at this garage. Yeah. And a great mechanic. Yeah, that's... It's a good piece of advice. Being in the manufacturing 3D printing world, I think that's been the magic behind this whole fascination with 3D printing, is that it's all doable. Yeah. Different scales. There, there's different scales for sure, but it just demystifies the process of making something that works, that's usable. Yeah. And I think that's been like the driving interest and, and factor in the whole hype around this technology that we built a business around. Yeah, totally. It's really interesting. This was cool. Yeah, thanks. Cause there's so much, there's so much that I think like firms like yours do that's just, it's a mystery. It's such a mystery cause there's so many bits and pieces people just can't 
wrap their minds around. Nobody understands what I do. <laughs> when we did the, the hat for Billy Porter, that yes. was like first time my mom was like, oh, Billy Porter, I love him. <laughs> She's, that's what you do. Yeah. I was like, yeah, that's what we do. I was like, cool, wait, my mom understands what we do now. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. You just got to work with Broadway stars. Yeah. And the parents understand. Yeah, yeah, if it appears on TV or, yeah. yeah. The Lady Gaga mask as well. Sure, yep. So thank you so much for joining us. This was a really great conversation. I feel like this is saying when we took that little break, I was saying that this is like an area that's in the intersection of design and engineering that I think is a big mystery to a lot of people. Totally, yeah. Just because it's so, you're still, every project's different. You're still finding your way like in, in every single project. But it was really cool to dive deep in and learn more about what you do in the process and all. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. I, it's one of those things that you can only learn by doing. Yeah. It's uh, because it involves... Fail forward, fail yeah, fast. Yeah, so, sure. I, I, like, you're, it's like creative problem solving. Yeah. And I don't know, my, if there's any takeaway, like any advice, it's just if you want to do stuff like this, you just got to start doing it. And, start, just, you just do it, yeah, like and he you, says. And you couldn't have done that 15 years ago. Yeah. Or like you just couldn't have unless you had a lot of money and now you don't need money there's you need the tools are incredibly cheap and incredibly available so much like free 3d modeling free video game engines like all the stuff that's that used to be incredibly cost prohibitive is it has a free version now at yeah. like the highest level like unity and unreal and yeah all that is free it's crazy unless there's a paywall eventually but if you hit that paywall it's because you're making a lot of money yeah, doing right. it. so the ability they moved to this model where you can learn on your own yeah uh, for free that's awesome pretty sweet that's awesome thanks again for joining on a weekend for sure. <laughs> thanks it's for coming pleasure. out in the cold it's, yeah, it's not freezing. that bad it's just a cold winter in general it is yeah it's colder than last year last year never got cold yeah but but i don't know but. 40s not that bad yeah could be worse. Could be much worse. The week of the 20s was... Uh, That's colder. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was yeah, cold. Yeah. That was too much. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks for coming, and thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And until next time. <laughs>